<coughs> Thank you very much. I ran into John sort of, um, I don't know, a few years ago at one of these sort of um, events somewhere and got on very well. Oh, no, we were both being recruited, actually, by, by a company who wanted some bad advice, you know, good advice, rather. Um, and um, you knew what you were talking about quite clearly, so I was very impressed. And um, anyway, so here I end up in front of you at this, to me, early hour of the morning, and I had to get up. I'm an owl rather than a lark, so I'm afraid if I don't make a lot of sense, it's probably because A, I don't know, and B, it's early in the morning for me. Um, I was still doing things at about three this morning. So <clears throat> that's the problem in the world, and I always go off at tangents, I'm afraid, but you do get these two different people and the sorts of people, and if they don't mix, actually you can get vulnerabilities because they're not talking, which is what an awful lot of these things about. There's the usual bullshit slide which suggests I know something about something um, highly unreliable as a result. Um, and I, but I've got some commercial um, interests and I've also got the whole parliamentary stuff. I used to write software, um, database stuff, um, to solve business problems, from accounting things all the way through to sort of front ends for this, that and the other. I was just in, interested in poking my nose into everybody else's business. Um, and as a result, when I ended up on, in the Lords, um, as IT stuff came through, people said, oh, Merlin, you must know about this. And so that's how I ended up sort of looking at all the cyber stuff. It started off, I suppose, big time with regulation, investigatory powers, and all the communications data, the, um, all the snooping provisions, the Anti-Terrorism Crime Security Act, all the stuff as it came through. And now we're all arguing away about data protection, copyright, intellectual property. And some of that will sound irrelevant to you, but actually it isn't entirely, as I'm going to try and show you in a moment. Um, the thing that always worries me about this is that people think that they can solve complex problems by having complex sets of rules. It doesn't work. In a complex system, rules merely affect one part of that complex system, and the rest of it reforms un around unpredictably, the law of unintended consequences. And I think that's something that, unfortunately, a lot of people don't get. We um, live in a common law society. We used to live in a common law society in Britain. Because we knew the Victorians sort of instinct, or we, we know, well back before then, we knew that you couldn't really control people the whole time. So we said, get on with it, but here are some boundaries outside which you mustn't go. And this is relevant. What's happened now is the Continentals liked rules based. They'd always had Roman law, the rules. It told you this is what you will do. It sounds great, but they soon worked out that it didn't work in the real world. So they allow a huge amount of local discretion to interpretation for how to deal with the real problem on the ground. So their rules, their laws are only there for aspirational purposes. This is what you ought to be doing, but they know it doesn't work in the real world. So they don't obey their rules. Over here, our rules are limits to behavior. So we think, you've got to obey it, regardless of the consequences. Um, and we don't understand that our laws are there for a different purpose. They are boundaries, they are limits to behavior. And the reason that's important is when you go look at the stuff which I'm about to talk about, which is coming out of Europe, they will behave towards in a very different way. If we behave in the same way, we'll probably open up vulnerabilities. And that's the challenge. Because we don't realize that it doesn't always work. We think that actually if you do it all right, it's all going to be fine. It'll be all right on the night. And we end up with having this rule set that we, we obey and we listen to. And it covers your backside. You know, if, if something goes wrong, you say, well, it wasn't me. I did it all right. I ticked all the boxes, etc." The fact that the entire company's bankrupt, the entire UK SCADA systems have gone down, or whatever it is, is another dirt issue. You know, that wasn't your fault. I know. But it, it, it does worry me. And this whole idea that regulation can solve all our problems, it won't. But the challenge is that um, people who are rule makers like to think they could get all the rules right if they got them all right. But the, um, but, and the trouble is that they're very often the people with the power to affect your lives. And it does worry me when, and that you, you need the role of the people who are very good on process and procedure, but you also need your people who are good at strategy and patterns and guessing what's going to happen next. And you need to have a mix of the two. If you have too many people who are thinking about the next thing, etc., you won't get systems that work. But if you're too rule-based, it's easy for nasty people to come in and penetrate the system. So how are we doing in the UK? Well, 14 months on from launch cybersecurity strategy, I think there's some good things happening. Um, I don't know the detail of it because I'm not actually living in that world the whole time. I hear good things, but I also hear that an awful lot of stuff isn't joined up. And things. I think at the critical national infrastructure level, um, a lot of attention is being paid because that's where the really good minds are focused and are worrying about it. 
and there's a, you know you can ring fence things to a certain extent. On the on the wider networks and information systems where we're looking at the private and public sector interfacing and all that, well, it's not the same. Not everything's going to the same standards. Not everything's going the same way. Um, the but how do you do it? It's it's difficult, and this is where. Uh, because the world is changing so fast, I mean, how long have we had the internet that we use for communicating every day? I don't mean when did Vint Cerf invent it, and I don't mean when did Tim Berners-Lee write the World Wide Web. How long have we actually used it for properly? 15 years? Something like that? A bit more? What would you say, John? How long have we used the internet for properly in anger in business? You know, 15, 20 years? I mean, I remember people getting excited about 1998 ish, no, perhaps a little bit earlier than that. When did you get your first email address, many of you, a personal one, and all that sort of stuff? It wasn't that long ago. So we're still evolving. We're at very, very early stages in all this technology. And I think we need to realize that. So nothing's going to be perfect, and we can't solve the problems overnight. Anyway, one of the things that's going to hit you, and I thought I should mention this, because, you know, I said, what are, what are, you know, how's it going 14 months on from the launch of the, the UK cyber, strategy, cyber security strategy? Well, it's going along, but it's not going brilliant, etc. The EU has decided to interfere, in general, for Europe. This is all part of the single market agenda. And this is why they reckon they've got the power to do it, and so things are coming out. And there are two lots in Europe which are about to attack you. Oh, no, sorry, not attack you. I mean, help you. Um, with lots more regulation and rules and everything like that, in order to try and improve the situation so that Europe become a global leader in this sort of thing and be totally secure, etc., etc and we'll all be working to the same standards. So on the one side, you've got the new directive on cybersecurity, which is quite well advanced, and final consultations have been delayed slightly, and I think you can still get something in. I think they're closing in April. Uh, certainly, there's a group I sit on that's just put in a, um, a, a, thing, a critique into it, which we're because not happy with it. But then, as I'm about to say, left, coming from left field, there's some other stuff. It's on the next slide. But the whole point about this has got five points in it. And they all sound good, achieving cyber resilience, reducing cyber crime, developing cyber defense, developing industrial and technical resources for cyber security. I always say I shouldn't read these things out. The key thing about this is going to apply to both public players, big players particularly, and all, um, the private ones and the public sector. It's going to affect everyone. And it's going to mandate lots of stuff that you've got to do and not do, what you've got to have in place, what you haven't got to get in place. Um, and how you're going to behave under a cyber attack to try and make us more resilient. How long have I got, actually? Only about five minutes. I'm going to go faster. Um, so the next thing that's going to hit you out of the digital single market agenda is a new directive on data protection, and that's pretty certain to happen. That's got some horrors in it from the point of view of gro about your cross-border transactions, liabilities, all sorts of stuff in there. For goodness sake, read it. I think that's also hasn't fully closed. You can still get some comments in on that. But when you get into the detail of it, it's got all sorts of stuff where you're going to have to report within 24 hours a data loss to the competent authority in your country or another country or whatever it is. They haven't quite decided. And it's all to have one regime across Europe and make life easier. But the reporting grants, could you, do, do you know you've had a data loss within 24 hours always? Do you want to report it? Think of all the other consequences, etc. And the EID proposal, where they're going to mandate, this one probably will fail, but we're not sure. And one of the proposals now that's most dangerous, which is a government will have um, th schemes that it's authorized, which will be government schemes, and that has to be recognized in all the other countries. You have to trust it. You have to recognize that scheme. So if someone from Romania comes into your system using a Romanian-issued government-authorized DID, they can come in, I think. I don't know for certain. So, you know, these could be vulnerabilities because they come into trust. Because this is the problem. It's always the insider problem. Who do you trust? Who do, who's, 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 am I okay? You don't really know. And one of the things that I've always liked, which I don't like about really joined up systems, because they look so wonderful and smooth and easy, is you lose that friction at the boundaries where you detect when something's going wrong. One of the things about silos, they're very, they can be inefficient. You need to work how to work across it. But when someone isn't single sign, when it's, someone's got to redo things every now and then, or someone's got to represent who they are or whatever, you can sometimes find inconsistencies. It's one way of detecting someone who isn't who they think 
who they ought to be. Um, you know, they'll give different information to, if we take government, simple government systems, to the DVLA and to the DWP or something like that. Very often we can't do anything about it, but you will find if you start looking, that's where you're getting consistent. So we've got to be very careful about some of this stuff. Because how do you trust? Because how do you trust me? Were you expecting this, a lord? Were you expecting Merlin, a wizard? As John said, I used to run around mountains and jump out of perfectly serviceable aeroplanes. Um, and I had a great time, and I spent a lot of time trying to penetrate physical security. It was great fun. You know, you'd sit and you'd watch, and the great thing is if they had a routine. you watch for about two days, get the routine, then you either triggered an emergency somewhere, so they all went running after it and left you a gap, or alternatively, you just waited till there was the gap in the routine, and then you could go in, etc. This is physical. Is there any difference in the cyberware? Not really. It's very, very similar. But I, um, oh, and I noticed that they've got a book. It's got a advanced evasion techniques. But um, I thought it must be the new SAS manual, but apparently it's something different. Um, and, or am I there sitting in the Lords? Actually, it's only John that told you, and I suppose Tony Neat knows me and so on, or two other people, that I am who I am. But I might not be. They've only all known me when the last, what, 10, 15, 10 years, 15 years, since Tony's been keeping a BDI on me when he was actually more a policeman. Anyway, so... Anyway, but this is one. All right, so what am I worried about? You know all these things, so I'm not going to run through them all. But there are lots of different things out there. The real problem comes in, the, again, it's this inside a bit. It's the fishing bit. It's the youngsters coming into your organization and behaving in a different way because they don't realize the danger in them um, revealing so much about themselves, about your organization inadvertently. It's that inadvertent leak that builds up a, an intelligence picture for someone else. And that intelligence picture may be used to penetrate your organization. And that's where I'm thinking about this business about trying to work out at certain boundaries where things don't quite match. Um, we know that um, little things, and we, we know that viruses, the, the virus signature files getting so big that you're going to have in a massive room just to hold the fuck dealing bomb. It's not going to work very soon. You know, we've got to find new ways of doing things. And are we really in advance it? I don't know. And the interesting thing that John said a moment ago about the power systems, etc. I was at a conference once where the champ said, can you imagine we might have to switch off um, the internet in order to protect ourselves? Well, if we really did switch off the internet, what would happen? The grid would come down, I suppose. Or would that be protected separately? If it comes down, how do you restart it? How do you restart the gas-fired stations? You know, because they need a power source to get them up and running again. There's all sorts of questions. It's so interrelated that it's not a simple issue. Um, and so very often, actually, attacking a system, I mean, if you want to get into a building, for instance, um, it used to be, and I've got no idea, because I haven't been in a physical security world for a while, it just press set off the fire alarms. Health and safety, everything fails open. It's seen films that they all rush in and steal everything. Yeah. Um, out of the thing, resisting out of the EU thing, they have got some points, you know, which is the international point bit. I did. I assumed there were lots of certs around the place, and every country had one or whatever. Apparently, they seem to think there's a deficiency in there. I went to Black Hat in Amsterdam. It was fascinating because there were a whole lot of them there, and I realised the importance of actually meeting people and networking because they, everyone got to be friends in the in the bar after both the certs and the hackers and everyone. So you could recognize people. So if there was a crisis, you could ring up your cert in Japan and say, hello, this is Fred. You know, we met in the bar in Amsterdam at Black Hat. Ah, oh, yes, I recognize it. You know, we had a bar. And then you can exchange information. Very often that's better than all the electronic tokens you can get. But it's the problem of trying to work out how you get around these other things. And I'm sure people... The problem is you can do everything and then you get blown up anyway. That was my castle, or would have been my castle if it had survived. But James VI, first, a lot of you, um, got in because we lost one thing and he could get inside. Watch out, the officials can get inside, blow you up. FSA, regulators, anyway. Um, there's lots of things that don't work, the practicalities thing, you make passwords so difficult, we all write them down. Um, as unencrypted, well, thinking about that sort of the unencrypted Wi-Fi. If you go into the Lords or in the Parliament, you can log on to the Wi-Fi, it's unencrypted. So the link here, how many people use it? I know it's an encrypted link at least. So at least there's less chance of someone managing. Well, except it doesn't, I don't know what encryption level it's at. It may be the old one, which is very easy to break in four seconds. I've got no idea. But you know, there's little things like that. You think you might be safe and you might, may not be. Um, you've got to watch out. I think the other thing is, is that we were very really fixed on protecting the endpoints, protecting the machines. You know, a lot of the government stuff mandated encrypted laptops and things like that. 
I don't think that really works. I think you've got to encrypt the information so it doesn't matter where it ends up. If the wrong person tries to get access to it, it can't. I've thought that for a long time. The question is how you do it. You know, I'm not going to go into technology. But I think it's, it's the information you're trying to protect, not, not the endpoint, not the machine. Um, other things you've got to worry about, at board levels, at senior levels. You know, what happens when your reputation is gone? If you've got this data breach stuff that's coming out of Europe, etc., and you suffer reputational damage, or actually you have a major penetration. You know, this is one of the reasons that a lot of stuff's hushed up, because they don't want the clients to know. If the banks reported the number of vulnerabilities there are, or the number of penetrations they've had, customers really get frightened. But if you think about it, you've got a big problem. If you've got large systems and you've got legacy systems and everything like that, you can't apply patches immediately they come out. You've got to test them, which means you're always vulnerable to that zero day, zero hour attack. The first ones are always going to get in there and you're going to clean them up retrospectively. Or am I wrong? Some other speaker can put you right on it. But that's my impression. And I've seen some of the software that monitors the level of this, so I know that it does happen. And it's a big problem. And so you've got these vulnerabilities with supply chain. You can't just buy from people who are wholly secure. They'll be producing very specialist stuff that you need, and you're going to have to deal with them. SMEs can't handle it. They ain't got the money, the manpower, the knowledge, anything. Tony can tell you all about that later. You know, and this is the problem. And we are operating in a cyber war environment very nearly. Um, I just downloaded, well, you can't download it, but you can read it online. There's a Tallinn manual just been approved on uh, rules for cyber warfare. And it's all about, you know, when are you allowed to actually go into a physical war because you've been attacked so much? It's like, it's like the Geneva Convention. It's a, was it 300 pages? It's very, very long. I haven't read much of it yet. But it's got this whole idea of the concepts of how we fight in a cyber war. Quite fun if you want some light reading um, one evening. Um, but it's an interesting point. People are to see, beginning to think, really, what the rules are. And it, it's got bits in there about, you know, don't touch certain bits of infrastructure because it's not humanitarian. If you close down the water systems and certain things, people will die, civilians will die, and things like that. So it's, it's an interesting thought, all that. Anyway, your real problem is the business case with all this, and but I'm very close to the end, is um, in the EU document, one of the things it's saying, the great justification is it's going to save companies up to 2.3 billion euros per year. But what's it going to cost you? You know? <laughs> I don't know anyone's done these costs, and it's very difficult doing these cost-benefit analyses, etc. Anyway, as I come to the end, I'm just going to say one of the worrying things that always worries me is laws and regulations never actually prevent what they're trying to forbid. I'm afraid that's their always thing. We always work around them or whatever. The other big problem is that the big boys, which most of you are, very often try to use regulation to kill the other big boys or the small guys from taking some of your market. It's actually counterproductive, I think, in the end, but. Everyone does it. It's a natural thing. If you get a regulation entrenching what you've got, and we watch it in standards bodies, we watch it in everything. Um, and the other, so at the end of the day, I think we've got to use incentives to get people to behave right. We've got to build in, because people otherwise you just break the rules. See, so we've got to build in security from the start. You can't retrofit it, and that's a big problem. Been a big problem with government contracts. Security is always the thing that comes at the tail end and particularly local government. And with the net internet working between local government and central government, you know, all this opens up more vulnerabilities, particularly when, for some agenda, it's mandated that you have to interface or whatever. And the other thing I've got very interested in data mining large data sets. I mean, I'm very worried, for instance, about this pro proposals under the um, communications data bill that they're producing to store everyone's um, internet and also um, who they call up. Not because I'm worried about the core intelligence, and not because of the civil liberties, but think of it as an intelligence target. If you are American, let's say you are well, a large in defense organization in America, and you want to sell some arms to some other country, which you know is a target, if you could get the information of who the senior UK company, defense companies, were talking to, and the amount of traffic and the volume of traffic, you've got a very good picture of who to go and talk to and what to do and et cetera. There's a lot of useful intelligence information in that. So, the end of it, the big problem with this is, is business flexibility versus government controls. It's trying to balance all this stuff. It's going to be very difficult, and you've got to respond faster than regulations, rules, and everything else will do, and they will be behind. So how on earth do you tick the boxes so you're protected while getting on with your job, which is protecting yourself? It can be difficult, particularly if the box ticking is wrong. Um, so you've got a big risk from that point. 
And security economics, there are lots of people who can do, teach you a lot about that, but it's a very good point. It's how you put your business case at the end of the day, if it's more, a little more expensive not to. And this is um, if you want to get hold of me um, at some point. I've got a telephone number up there. Or, yes, arolm at parliament.uk. Anyway, I think I've overrun the part of this. No, no, thank you.